Good evening. I am James Cornelius, the curator of the Lincoln Collection here at the Presidential Library and Museum, and we thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, Stephen Harrigan, whose book we are all drawn by, comes to us tonight from three readings in Texas, where he resides, uh, en route to appearances later this month at the famous Politics and Prose Bookstore in Washington, D.C., and at the Carter Library in Atlanta. He thus briefly leaves behind his wife and their three daughters and their four grandchildren for our benefit tonight. He is the author of 10 works of fiction and nonfiction. The novelist Anne Beatty called Steve's first novel, quote, a subtly told and deeply felt story. Pulitzer Prize historian Joseph J. Ellis said that this new book is historical fiction at its very best. A friend of Mr. Lincoln has also received warm praise from the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, Publishers Weekly, and, as we speak, the New York Times. Uh, if you were reading closely, our advertising for tonight's event has thus been proven true. They had told us at the Times that they would review it, and the electronic version will hit your screen tomorrow for the print edition this Sunday. Uh, Steve's novel, The Gates of the Alamo, also published by Knopf, was a New York Times bestseller. It has some chronological overlap with tonight's book, but his other settings have included a sculptor after World War I, a porpoise circus, and travel essays that span the continent written for several magazines. As a screenwriter, wearing a different hat, Steve gave us Beyond the Prairie, the true story of Laura Ingalls Wilder in two parts on CBS, uh, and The Colt about the first Michigan cavalry in the Civil War. He also updated the King Lear story to a Texas cattle ranch in a film starring Patrick Stewart, Roy Scheider, and the comic David Allen Greer. So, uh, Steve, you natives of Oklahoma can and really do ride around the map. I loved this novel when I read it because he did such deep research here in Springfield and elsewhere, and because I hope you will agree with me, he is an excellent storyteller. After he speaks tonight here at the podium, we will have some questions and comments from you, the audience, I hope. And so now, please, let us all welcome Stephen Harrigan. Thank you, James. Uh, and thank you to the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum for this really you know, wonderful opportunity for me to, to be at Ground Zero, where all, all this wonderful history that I wrote about in the book happened. Uh, James was, and, and the staff at the library and museum were so hospitable and generous to me while I was working on this book. Uh, there are other people here tonight, like Guy Fraker, who, who wrote uh, a wonderful book called Lincoln's Ladder to the Presidency. And it's a little, uh, it's thrilling for me to be here. It's a little intimidating and humbling because if you're a novelist, you're kind of a hit and run artist. You know, you come in and you, you, you do this deep dive into research, you write your book, you go on to the next thing. And you know, here I am among, among scholars and probably many of you in the audience who have spent much of your life studying Lincoln, uh, learning about him, trying to understand what made him work. So I don't claim to be an authority other than anything, uh, other than I'm an authority on the novel I just wrote, although I did have to read it again to remember <laughs> the stuff I said in it. Uh, I, I thought I would talk tonight a little bit about why I wrote this book. Uh, I'm not from here. Uh, Lincoln, of course, has always been a figure of fascination to me as he is to most people in the world. But I, this book was kind of a happy accident. I had, I had just finished a novel 
was casting around for something else to write about. And my wife and I were taking a, a long road trip from our home in Austin, Texas to Massachusetts one summer. And in the car, we were listening to uh, the audiobook of Team of Rivals by Doris Kearns Goodwin, which I'm sure many of you have read. And if you've read it, you know that it's mostly about Lincoln's presidency and his cabinet. But there was a part of the book that dealt with his early life in Springfield. And there was one passage in particular that really leapt out at me. Uh, my wife and I were driving along and listening to the part where uh, Lincoln is, as he happened, as happened once or twice, he sort of accidentally got, it, got engaged to be married as a young man. And this was a woman named Mary Owens, not Mary Todd, whom he married later, but Mary Owens, who was the sister of, of, of someone who lived in New Salem. And Lincoln sort of got, you know, ineptly <laughs> seemed to have gotten engaged without maybe quite meaning to. And uh, he had moved to Springfield to, to, to become a lawyer, and uh, Mary Owens was living at that time in New Salem, and he wrote her a letter uh, in which he talked about their upcoming marriage and uh, was talking about how fancy everybody was in, uh, in Springfield and how they were all riding around in carriages and how it might be difficult for her to get accustomed to that life because she was from a more uh, well-to-do family in Kentucky. And the part of it that really leapt out at me was this paragraph. He wrote to, her, to Mary Owens, I much wish you would think seriously before you decide, meaning decide about getting married. For my part, I have already decided. What I have said I will most positively abide by, provided you wish it. My opinion is that you had better not do it. And, and I heard that, and I thought, you know, this has got to be the most equivocal love letter in American history. Uh, and I, I, we, were, we were heading up, you know, north, and I said to my wife, let's just make a detour to Springfield, where we had never been. And uh, we came here. We came to the museum. Actually, we, that trip, we didn't get to the museum because it was closed. We got there too late. But we were uh, able to see Lincoln's house. Uh, we were able to go down to the state house, the old state house. And I had the impression, uh, one of the wonderful things about this city is, you know, the footprint of history is still here. You, you walk down Washington, Jefferson, Adams Street. You you feel like you're back in 1830s and 1840s. You can imagine yourself walking down the street and Lincoln, you know, heading your way. And I kept thinking I couldn't get over the uncertainty that he had voiced in that letter, the confusion that, that was in that letter. And I kept wondering about this guy because... You know, like everybody, I revered, admired Lincoln, but I never thought I really knew him. And that that one little passage in in that book was a was a window into to someone who I thought I might recognize more readily as a human being. And the more I read about him at this period of his life, the more I understood that he was very human. He was uh, ferociously ambitious, as you all know. Uh, and he was also under construction as a human being. He wasn't yet the Lincoln we thought we all knew. He was uh, often very confused, often uh, confounded, often overreaching, uh, you know, stumbling over his own feet, his own ethical feet at times. Uh, he, would, uh, he would write anonymous uh, or, or at least pseudonymous, uh, scurrilous articles in the newspapers attacking his political opponents. Uh, this backfired on him a number of times, most notably when he, uh, when he attacked James Shields, the state auditor, and Shields uh, took great offense and challenged him to a duel. And as many of you know, Lincoln got maneuvered into this, into this duel and uh, it seems to have been kind of comical at first and developed into something very serious. And Lincoln's, uh, Lincoln, as the challenged party, was, 
was uh, able to choose the weapons, and he chose broadswords. Uh, no accident for a guy with really long arms who towered over his opponent. Fortunately, that that uh, that duel didn't didn't happen, but it almost did, and it's 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 in the book as well. And Lincoln was, I think, a very principled and moral person, but was always sort of overstepping not knowing exactly where the boundaries were yet, not having figured it out. And he was uh, constantly, not constantly, but very often, you know, getting himself into embrigglements, as, as the, the, the word used for his relationship with Mary Todd, the famous word. And very much of this novel is about his relationship with Mary Todd, who is a fascinating character, a deeply tragic character, and uh, someone who in, in the 1830s and the 1840s, I think, would have been a really riveting personality, somebody who was ex- as, as political as her husband, as ambitious as her husband, who had gone to Madame Mantel's academy in Lexington, Kentucky, spoke fluent French, uh, and was someone who, if she could have voted or who would have run for office, might have had a very different life. Uh, so a large part of this is about the, the, the complicated and maybe uh, star-crossed relationship between Lincoln and Mary Todd. This, also, this book is also very much about friendship. Uh, Lincoln was surrounded by people who were equally impressive as he was, or perhaps if we had encountered them in a, at, a, at a party at Ninny and Edwards' mansion, we might have found them more impressive than Lincoln. People, of course, like Stephen Douglas or Ned Baker or John Stewart or John J. Harden. Uh, I keep thinking, while I was writing this book, I kept thinking about, a, there was a scene in the book where Lincoln and John J. Harden and Ned Baker, Edward Dickinson Baker, were all talking and at a party, and uh, John J. Hardin became one of the most famous men in the country. He was killed at the Battle of Buena Vista during the Mexican War. 15,000 people came to his funeral. Uh, Ned Baker was a, uh, a, you know, a senator from Oregon, one of the great orators of his day. He was killed at the Battle of Ball's Bluff, one of the early battles of the Civil War. And Lincoln, of course, was assassinated at the end of the war. So the I, it's, it's, it, was, it struck me as so poignant that here were three great men in the making, all of whom died violently, all of whom you know, came from Illinois. Lincoln was very much embroiled and involved in the social life of Springfield and in the professional life. Uh, he was, of course, a member of the Eighth Judicial Circuit and traveled, uh, was a guy, 10,000 square miles sometimes and on, you know, on horseback or in carriages, uh, traveling around, going from county seat to county seat. Uh, he seems to have loved it. It seems to have been like a, uh, uh, like a, a band on tour in, in a lot of ways for these for these lawyers and judges who rode the circuit. Uh, he was also a member of a poetry society here in Sprinkling, in Sprinkling, <laughs> excuse me, Springfield, and um, this gave me the opening I needed to create the fictional character that I thought I, I required to be able to bring to, to bring the reader as close to Lincoln as I could. I wanted a I wanted a fictional character. This is, although this is a novel, it's it's very much researched and very much uh, I hope uh, attentive to the facts in the historical record. But I decided as I wanted to tell it in a fictional way. I wanted to be in the room with Lincoln. I wanted to have an, an intimacy with him. I wanted the reader to feel like he was there with him at all times during this particularly formative time of his life. So what I did was I decided. I would extract a couple people from the historical record and plug my guy into it. And I plugged my guy into the Poetry Society and made him a poet. His name is McCaja Weatherby. Uh, he goes by, uh, by Cage. Lincoln knows him as Cage. Uh, they are, Link, he meet, this book takes place from about 1832 to 1847 when Lincoln goes off to Congress in Washington. And Lincoln and Cage meet during the Black Hawk War. 
at the Second Battle of Kellogg's Grove, where Lincoln has the the task of of, of gathering up the dead and mutilated men who have been killed in, in, in the battle that took place the day previous in which Cage participated. So they form this intense friendship. They become members of the Poetry Society together. Cage is as ambitious as Lincoln is, uh, but in a different direction. He wants to be a, a renowned man of letters. He wants to make a mark. And all of these people in Springfield, one of the most remarkable things for me is how how ferocious and, and, and unrelenting that ambition was. So I created a guy who could fit in with them, but was a little bit uh, off to the side in terms of politics so that we could have the perspective of an outsider and, and watching Lincoln and his, and his fellow politicos. Lincoln was a very good poet, and I'm sure many of you know this, uh, and it, it, this was no more true than in, in uh, a poem he wrote called My Childhood Home, I See Again, when he went home to Indiana, where he had done, done a lot of his growing up, and he visited old haunts and, child, and graves and, and visited old friends. And I'll, I'll just give you an example of, of how good a poet he was. These are just a few stanzas from uh, My Childhood Home, I See Again. Near 20 years have passed away since here I bid farewell to woods and fields and scenes of play and playmates loved so well, where many were but few remain of old familiar things. But seeing them to mind again, the lost and absent brings. The friends I left that parting day, how changed as time has sped. Young childhood grown, strong manhood gray, and half of all are dead. I hear the loved survivors tell how naught from death could save till every sound appears a knell and every spot a grave. I range the fields with pensive tread and pace the hollow rooms and feel companion of the dead. I'm living in the tombs. That's pretty good. And uh, had Lincoln gone in a different direction, I think we might be reading him in anthologies today as a poet rather than as, as a speechwriter and president. Uh, so there was, a, there was a depth to his character that was so palpable to me. Uh, I was so fascinated by, by how forlorn and melancholy he sometimes seemed. And that was, to me, a, a, a conflicted, complicated good-hearted character that would be worth a novel. So I created Cage Weatherby to be his observer, uh, to be his friend, and to give the reader an entree into his life. And I was going to read a little bit, a small passage, just a few pages from the novel. And this takes place uh, deep into the story. Uh, Lincoln has, has been engaged sort of again with Mary Todd uh, and he meets a woman named Matilda Edwards who uh, had come into Springfield and she was this beautiful young woman that everybody in town seemed to have uh, taken a shine to and Lincoln believed himself to be in love with her. There are many interpretations of what happened between Lincoln and Mary. This is just one. And, uh, but I, from what I can tell, it seems to be maybe the most reasonable. And Lincoln f fell in love or thought he fell in love with this woman, Matilda Edwards. And he went to talk to her, to, to Mary, to break off their engagement. And something happened there and it, it didn't break off. She, uh, she basically, he ended up getting in deeper with her. She, she wouldn't take no for an answer, basically. And uh, time passed, and they were still engaged, and there seems to have been another break, and probably during a Christmas trip to Jacksonville to the Hardin home. And after that, something happened. I think it was probably in... Uh, the Lincoln scholars out there can debate with me. I think it was probably a letter that Lincoln, that Mary wrote to, to Lincoln saying that basically, okay, if you don't want to get married, that's fine with me. I release you from your vows. Lincoln got that letter or got the news some other way. In my book, he gets a letter and falls apart. He, he thinks he's 
gone back on his word. He's dishonored Mary. He's dishonored himself. He's destroyed his own character. He's, he's, uh, he's been hit in the vital spot, which is his honor. So he is deeply ashamed. He falls into a desperate depression. He spends uh, a week or so not going to the, to, to his, to the state house to, for his legislative responsibilities. His friends are, are, are very concerned about him. Uh, earlier, they had, he had been suicidal. Now he seems to be just, uh, just catatonic. And they've taken him to a doctor's house. Uh, I've made up a, a doctor out of a couple doctor friends of Lincoln. His name is Ashbel Merritt. And they've just, you know, Joshua Speed, one of his other great friends, and Cage have taken him to the doctor's house. And this is the scene that happens after that. Ash Merritt kept Lincoln at his house for a few days, forcing wine into his temperance-minded patient, giving him vinegar baths and mustard rubs, and stroking his limbs with a flesh brush to move the blood along. He recovered enough to speak and to eat some bread soaked in milk, and to decide that he wanted to go home, back to his room in Speed's store. The legislative session was still underway, but he did not have the strength of mind or body to return to his duties at the State House. I'm the most miserable man living, he volunteered in a faint voice when Cage stopped by with a pan of barley soup that Mrs. Hopper had made. It was still very cold and bleak, and the soup had frozen on the short walk from the Palatine to Speed's store. The Palatine is Cage's boarding house that he owns. Lincoln was out of bed, at least, warming his feet with his, along with the soup by the stove, a blanket thrown over his shoulders and over his head so that he looked like a medieval carving of a wizened monk in a cowl. Maybe it was a good sign that he had passed from a condition of almost utter passivity to a groaning state of self-pity. There were customers in the store below, and Cage and Lincoln could hear Speed's voice as he waited on them, his heartiness and friendliness reaching Lincoln almost as a taunt. What are they saying about me, he asked. I don't have the will to read a paper. Are they mocking me? No, everybody thinks you have gravel and that you'll return to the assembly in a few days. Gravel is our kidney stones. I would rather pass a shovel load of gravel than feel one-tenth of what I'm feeling, Cage. Oh, God, it's so horrible. He began to cry. Maybe that was another good thing, his emotions seeping from their encapsulated gloom like the pus from a lanced boil. Have you heard anything about her, he asked. Is she back in Springfield? Yes, but it will do you no good to think about her. How can I not? I destroyed her life. Maybe I should write to her, beg her to marry me after all. Well, she wouldn't have me now, would she, after I've dishonored myself so completely? You haven't dishonored yourself, and why in the world could you ever think it would be a good idea for you to take up with Mary Todd again? You're well out of it. Put that woman out of your mind, put your past with her out of your mind, and find a way to live. There's no way, Lincoln said, no way for me to live. His spoken catalog of shame and self-disgust was a painful thing to witness, but Cage thought it best to keep him speaking so that he didn't sink back into catatonic despair. I think the weather is having an effect on you, Cage said, but it won't be cold forever, it won't be dark forever, and your mood will change with the weather if you give yourself a chance to let it. Lincoln refused to acknowledge this useless bromide, he shifted the blanket so that it no longer covered his head and gave Cage a look that suggested any further comments of that sort would be painful. In the light from the stove, his forehead glistened with sweat. His eyes were still frighteningly blank. It was hard to believe there had ever been any life in them at all. Would you like to go to Bogota, Colombia? Cage asked him. What? A diplomatic posting. Hardin said to run the idea past you if you were up to hearing about it. The post will go to a Whig after Harrison is inaugurated. Stewart might be able to get it for you. I don't speak the Spanish. You taught yourself the law, you can learn another language. Is that what all my friends are arranging to get rid of me by sending me to South America? 
A change of scene is supposed to help in these cases. These cases, there was energy at last in Lincoln's voice. I suppose by that you mean that there's nothing unusual about what I'm feeling. The blues are not, the, this is not blue cage, this is black, utter black. It's the blackness of a wasted life, a life that has done no one any good and that no one will ever remember, nor should. So yes, send me to Columbia, better yet Patagonia. Whatever remote crevice of the earth anybody wants to stuff me into will be just fine with me. This eruption of anger lasted no longer than a powder flash. And then there was lethargy again, an intolerably morose silence. Cage gave up trying to talk Lincoln out of his malaise. His presence was only aggravating it. He went home, feeling the press of the deep gray winter sky upon his own mood, fighting against his own sense of futility. When he was in a spirited frame of mind, Abraham Lincoln was the most contagious man Cage had ever known. But now he found that his friend's inner darkness could be transmitted as well. In a less remarkable and magnetic individual, the hypo would have been a private trial. But Lincoln's character was so public and powerful that it seemed capable of operating in reverse, siphoning back all the life and laughter it had once sent flooding into the world. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So. That's just a glimpse into the tone of the novel, I guess, and, and the, the way I've depicted Lincoln. Uh, I'd be very happy to answer any questions about the book or about the process of writing it, if anybody had any. Uh, I can't see out there very well. So, uh, James, are you there? Oh. <laughs> we have a couple of Okay. Which may or may not be uh, already on your mind. I know some of you have already started reading the book, but there's a female character in the book who is, shall we say, from a different walk of life than Mary Todd. Did you, uh, is she based on research you did on actual people, or how did you come up with that? Well, Ellie, as you mentioned, is from a different walk of life. She is a, a, a woman of the night, or <laughs> however you want to phrase that. Uh, it, she is, I wouldn't say based on a real person. She is inspired by a, a, a reference in, in the, you know, the compendium of information that William Herndon, Lincoln's law partner, acquired after his death. And uh, he mentioned that Joshua Speed had a relationship with a, a young woman uh, and kept her in, a, in, a, in, some, in some house or some, some place, and that uh, Lincoln at one time visited her uh, in a professional manner. And I, I, that's all that was there. And the rest is, to answer your question as directly as possible, the rest is my imagination. I, I made up this woman. Uh, I mean, and I think scholars will disagree about whether she actually existed, whether Lincoln actually visited her. He certainly wasn't, uh, wasn't a prude in any sense. Uh, so I think it's not unlikely that he might have had contact with somebody like that. But for me, it was an opportunity to, uh, part, of the, part of the challenge of this book was to create, it's called A Friend of Mr. Lincoln. I wanted to create a character that, that had the same valence as Lincoln, that somebody that would be an authentic character and not just a, uh, not just a device to, to view Lincoln through. So I, I wanted him to have kind of a love story. And the story between him and Ellie is kind of a love story. It's very tough and unrequited to some degree. Uh, but it gave me an opportunity to flesh uh, Cage out and to create a, a woman that, uh, that I thought was really interesting and a little bit, uh, a little bit representative of her, of her time, maybe a little bit ahead of her time in terms of her expectations, in terms of her own ambition. And so that's how that character developed. And it was 
really fun to write about her. I did a lot. She's a, uh, she, you know, she's has a millinery shop. So I did a lot of a lot of the last three years I've spent looking through pattern books and you know uh, stuff like that, looking at fashion illustrations of that time, trying to to understand what her world would have been like, what she would, you know, what her shop would have been like. So, but that's kind of the. You know, you, you, you come up with an idea for a character and then you sort of sink into research and try to make, make your idea of that character plausible to the time and place. So that was the origin of Ellie. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know if everybody could hear that, but how long was I here? Where did I stay and where did I eat? Uh, okay. Uh, I was here three different times. Uh, I stayed at the Holiday Inn Express. Uh, is that Everett Dirksen Road? Where is that? I ate at Bob Evans. <laughs> <laughs> I ate the free breakfast at the Holiday Inn Express. Uh, I ate at one of the places on the square there, one of those sandwich shops or the, maybe the Italian restaurant. For, pardon me for not remembering all the names. Uh, and I went to see Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter while I was here because it had uh, just come out. And uh, I was with James and Brian Andreessen in the, uh, in the library one day. And I thought they would be so scornful of that movie. But they were all real excited. They were, <laughs> they were really ready to see it. And uh, I just kept, I watched that movie. I kept kicking myself. Why didn't I think of vampires? You know? <laughs> because it would be a, <laughs> a little easier get people into into the bookstores but uh but yeah i love springfield it was it was and uh i i went out with guy fraker on the judicial circuit or at least part of it saw a little bit of the countryside um and then went home and hit the books and you know read and read and uh called people up uh just tried to i mean you can see the as i said the footprint of springfield here today but to try to like really get back into that time frame to build my own time machine to get back here when there was no Bob Evans. Uh, it was it was a little more difficult. Yeah. Why did you choose this part of Lincoln's life to write about rather than, say, when he was president or a congressman or something like that? It felt more uh, open to me. It felt... Uh, it felt a, a little bit less explored. I mean, as, as we all know, there are 10 million Lincoln books, and I knew, I knew going in, have you ever seen that stack at Ford's Theater of all the Lincoln books? Well, I knew that, you know, if I were lucky, somebody would toss my book up on the top of that stack for about five minutes, and then it would continue to grow. So I, I, I wanted something that, I wanted to write about a part of his life that was meaningful to me, that, uh, that felt, vivid to me and real and I it's not that I wasn't interested in Lincoln as a you know in his later life when you know during the Senate campaign or the debates with Douglas or uh, you know during his presidency but I felt that I felt that ground had been covered plenty by Gore Vidal in fiction for one and uh, I felt there was just a little window here and through which I could glimpse him and uh, and I'm also drawn to people. And I think every it's true of every novelist. I think you're drawn to people who are conflicted and unfinished. Uh, history has not decided about these people yet, and uh, it could have gone a bunch of different ways. At one point, <laughs> this is this is really strange, but I uh, there's part of the book that involves the Donner Party, which, as you know, left from Springfield. And I once wrote a uh, I once wrote a a, a TV movie for HBO that never got produced, but they hired me to write a Donner Party movie, so I knew a lot about the Donner Party. And uh, I thought for a while, well, you know, this guy had Lincoln hunting vampires. Maybe I could have him going on the Donner Party. <laughs> and that would be interesting, <laughs> you know. Uh, but I just couldn't make myself do it. I, I, I am just too, uh, you know, as a, as a novelist, I am... Uh, I, I feel a certain amount of license with history. Like I, I felt enough, I felt it was okay to introduce a fictional character into this world. 
but I didn't feel it was okay to, to break down the, the borders of it. And so uh, I, I just couldn't make myself do it. But uh, that, uh, back to your question, I was just drawn viscerally to this, to this part of his life because he was somebody I could recognize and, and understand, I think. Anything? Back there. I have not read your book yet, uh, but I'm curious the time frame that you covered Lincoln. Um, did you address anything related to slavery or his thoughts? Oh yes. On that. Yeah. Uh, Would you mind commenting? Sure. I forgot to mention that. I'm sorry. It was, of course, an, a very important part of, of this story and of our national story. Uh, Lincoln, in the book, is reluctant to touch the third rail of politics, which is abolition. And uh, he is, uh, I think, genuinely, genuinely, at this point in his life, genuinely abhorred slavery, but was much more concerned about disorder and chaos and what you know what could be unleashed by outright abolition uh, there's a he does i made up a scene in the book where he represents a woman a, a runaway slave and uh there's a court proceeding and he wins this woman her freedom in a in a in a courtroom scene uh so and i also include the part of the historical record where he represented a slave owner later in his career. So the, the issue of slavery was a burning issue during the period of this, of this novel. Lincoln is uh, cautiously uh, cautious about it. He's, uh, and that's, again, that's another reason I wanted to write about him. He was so, uh, you know, he, he was so, I think, genuinely ethical and moral, and yet, to some degree, like we all are today, to to the issues of our day, to some degree, somewhat blind to what you know the the raging concern, the you know the most the most powerful moral outrage was, and I I find that to be compelling as a as a novelist. I don't find it to be I don't condemn him for that no more than I condemn myself for my own retrograde views about various issues. But I, I, it, it made him more human to me to, to, to see a guy who was conflicted, wh where his, his moral principles were in the way of his own advancement and career. And he was, he was not yet the great emancipator. He, like I said, he was a work in progress. He was under construction, somebody who was trying to become the person he knew he ought to be. I think somebody over there had a hand up. But, you know, Guy, huh? You mentioned the downward burning, and I was uh, doing some questions. I said, what about the Oh, good. Oh, well, thank you. The point is that James Reed, uh, a, member, a Springfield resident, uh, part of the Donner Party, is just briefly in the novel, but uh, but Guy Fraker felt that it was very uh, adeptly portrayed. Yeah, thank you for that. And and James Reed is a compelling character. He was, you know, he was the driving force of the Donner Party, and uh, a kind of complicated guy on his own. And one of the things that I discovered at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum, we went through Lincoln's legal papers, was that Reed had been represented by Lincoln, he had been sued by Lincoln, and that in the murder of Henry Truett. I'm sorry, in the murder of, of Jacob Early by Henry Truett, which is a famous case, which is depicted in the book, in which uh, Jacob Early, a, uh, a Democrat, was, was killed by a fellow Democrat in the lobby of the Globe Tavern or the, the public room, shot, shot down. And it turns out one of the witnesses was James Reed. And uh, this is, of course, a famous case, and many of you know about it, where Lincoln managed to get Truett off 
by, uh, by, on, on self-defense because Jacob Early, knowing he was about to be shot, had picked up a chair to defend himself, and Lincoln persuasively argued that, that Early was attacking Truett, and that Truett had shot him in self-defense. So this is another point of conflict between him and my character Cage, because Cage and James Reed are sitting there talking in the Globe Tavern when this event happens. So they're both witnesses, and Cage is, is cross-examined by Lincoln and, uh, and made to say things that he didn't want to say and sort of aids Lincoln's case of self-defense for the murderer. So uh, again, it's, there were these happy conjunctions. I, I, uh, I, needed, I needed the Donner Party in this movie. I need this movie, excuse me, in this book. I needed uh, I needed James Reed as a character, and lo and behold, exactly when I needed him, there he was in the historical record. Did Matilda ever give Lincoln any cause to think that that he might have a chance with her? I don't think so. I don't see it, James. Do you think Matilda Edwards ever led Lincoln on? <laughs> Supposedly, there were 22 marriage proposals to her in a, in a three month period. Yeah. Different, 22 different men, supposedly. Yeah. And Lincoln was imaginative enough, I think, to, and naive enough to think that he had a shot. But uh, I, I, think, I think Matilda was out of his league. So. I'd like to know what you think of Herndon and do you have some depth of his character and based on Lincoln and Herndon and their law practice? Well, Herndon is a, uh, William Herndon, his law partner, is a character in, in the book. And in the first chapter, uh, the first chapter takes place here in Springfield right after the assassination when Lincoln is lying in state. And my character, Cage, is back in town having been gone for many years and he meets up with Herndon again. And Herndon is, you know, sorrowing and embittered against Mary Lincoln and uh, talking to my character about maybe writing a book. <laughs> and uh, as you know, Herndon is, is a uh, very controversial but very indispensable source, I think, for Lincoln's early life because he spent a lot of time and a lot of energy uh, searching out what really happened. And I was impressed. I know, I know various historians deal with Herndon in different ways because it's a huge amount of material. Not all of it, of course, can be reliable. But I was impressed to read Herndon's letters to the people he was asking for information from. He, you know, James and I were talking about this earlier today. Herndon seemed to have the instincts of a journalist when he was, when he was writing these people. He wanted to know the real truth. He didn't want it embellished. He wanted uh, he wanted the actual, authentic stories. Whether those stories turned out to be true or not, you know, he couldn't fact check them. I guess, but it is, a, I think, a remarkable compendium of information. That without it, I think the the we'd we'd have a very thin grasp of this part of Lincoln's life. So I'm a uh, I'm a Herndon fan. But, you know, with, with due acknowledgement to the skeptics, you know, so I hope that's not too qualified an answer. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, is Lincoln a father in your book? And if so, do you delve at all into his relationship with his oldest son, Robert? Uh, we see Robert as an infant. And we, but we don't see, we don't see Lincoln as an active father in the book. Uh, that comes later in his life, or beyond the scope of the book. I'm fascinated by Lincoln as a father, though. I mean, that could be another novel, I think. And I'm, uh, I'm fascinated by the relationship between Robert and his father, between Robert and his mother. I mean, I, I can't believe nobody's ever written a novel about, about those three. And, uh, and it's such a tragic story. I was at the Lincoln House today, and one of the, uh, you know, the, the guide was pointing out the mantle in the sitting room with the little holes in it where the Lincoln children had hung their stockings. And you can't look at that and not think, oh, gee, you know, what a, what tragedy beset this family? You know, the, 
three boys dying, Mary watching her husband shot in front of her. Uh, no wonder she went around the bend. And uh, so it's, but it's hard to, you know, there's so much legend grown, grown up around him as a father and the family and everything. It'd be really wonderful to have a, a grasp of what their home life was actually like. Uh, and I think, again, that's where a novelist, maybe I'm talking myself into a sequel. <laughs> that's where a novelist could really, I think, uh, you know, burrow deep. And, and Because it was a complicated marriage, you know, and he was, he was gone a lot. He was not schooled in how to be a husband. Um, and she was a little bit demanding and a little bit, you know, certain of how things ought to be. So uh, it could be a really fascinating domestic drama between the two of them and their, their children. Uh, is that about it? One more? I have one more question. I'm curious if you think, given that you have written uh, one or two other things involving uh, military figures and military settings, that early in this book you've got the scene in the Black Hawk War, as you described, uh, at Kellogg's Grove. Do you get what's your sense of how Lincoln felt about his fellow soldiers? Were they stronger friends of his as a result, or did he want to try to get away from that horrific scene later in life? Uh, I think Lincoln had a, a bond with his fellow soldiers, and I think you know when you, you keep stumbling across. Seems like everybody in Springfield had served in the Black Hawk War, and you know, well, for instance, Jacob Early, uh, who who Henry Truett shot in the lobby of the Globe Hotel, and whom Lincoln defended and got off for the murder of Jacob Early. Early was Lincoln's captain in the Mounted Spy Company he was part of. So, I mean, it was it was a small world, and I think you you can't imagine. Uh, those people not feeling a bond, uh, having uh, served together. Uh, and Lincoln never saw combat, but he certainly saw a lot of awful stuff. And uh, I think that uh, it must have been a, a, a deep bond that he carried with him. And I think to his men, when he was a captain in the militia, he was probably a very beloved figure. When he was just a private, as he, he, let, he got mustered out and became a private later in the summer, uh, I think he was, I, I, I portray him as a natural leader uh, of, this, of this group of people he's with. Whether that's actually true or not, I can't totally defend, but I can't imagine people not wanting to follow Abraham Lincoln. Uh, he was a compelling character, a magnetic individual and, uh, and a powerful one, physically powerful. So I think the war had, even though it only lasted a summer, had this tremendous bonding effect on, on a lot of people in Springfield. And even though Lincoln never really talked about it, except in, a, in one or two letters, I guess, it, uh, he, uh, he certainly must have carried it with him and been aware of it uh, his whole life. Right. Some, yeah, some people had to be on the cutting room floor, <laughs> and Elijah Isles was. One. I mean, but the problem with writing this book is there are so many people in Springfield. Orville Browning is another person I didn't. It didn't. I didn't. I just didn't have time to include him. Uh, but there are so many people who were really important in his life, and I had to kind of shrink the cast of characters to the ones that I could. I could manage. And uh, so I'm afraid, no, you won't see see Elijah Isles in the book, but uh, just know that I tried to get him in, you know, and, uh, you know, there's, uh, there are all these heartbreaking decisions you have to make, you know, when you write a book like this, because, you know, you have to keep the narrative moving forward and you can't, you can't write it, you know, you can't have historians looking over your shoulder you know, you have to remind yourself, I'm a novelist, I'm not an historian. I've got to keep the story, you know, in a straight line. But I, uh, you know, I was certainly aware of, of a lot of people who didn't make it into the book.
uh, his name is McCage Weatherby, so Cage is a shortened form of that. And, I, you know, sometimes you do things without having any reason. Uh, but I, uh, I'd written a novel about the Alamo uh, about 15 or 16 years ago called The Gates of the Alamo. And there was an historical, uh, there was a defender of the Alamo named Macaja Autry. And I was looking for a 19th century name. And I thought, well, I'll just steal Macaja Autry's name. And, and when I started to think about Macaja, I mean, you, people just might call him Cage because that's a, you know easy handle. So I noticed a couple reviewers have made hay of that, uh, of that name because Cage is encaged in his life and all this stuff. I, you know, I just write this stuff. I, I don't, <laughs> I don't. It has no symbolic, no obvious symbolic power to me when I'm writing it. So, but it felt the reason I named him that was it felt like the name of somebody who would have lived in that time. There's another guy with the first name of Nimmo, which is a name I liked. So I. I created a character named Nimmo Rhodes, who's a, who's a bad guy in the book. So just, you know, looking for 19th century names, looking for 19th century expressions like by jings and stuff like that, just to, to give the flavor of, of, of what it would have been like in Springfield at that time. Okay. Well, let's have another round of applause. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. It's wonderful to be here.